My name is Joe Pullman, and I'm a professor at University of Colorado Boulder. If you're an educator, I'm sure you've heard the question, why are we learning this? You probably asked it when you were a student. Our answer should be, because it matters to things you care about. To answer the question, why are we learning science, my colleagues and I attempt to contextualize science in life. Science and technology relate to many personal concerns of young people and the adults they'll become. Examples are health, nutrition, and technology. They also relate to societal concerns people have and can inform public debates and votes. Examples are environmental, energy, and health policies. To help you appreciate the approach we're taking to prepare today's youth, I have a story from 1982. When I was in 10th grade, my mom had just gone through the painful process of quitting smoking for the third time. So I decided to write about the dangers of smoking for a school essay. I researched the topic using state-of-the-art information technology of the day. <laughs> Primarily what I could find at the library through the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature. It was an it was an interesting time to look for information on the dangers of smoking. As we now know, the tobacco industry deliberately manufactured doubt about the health effects of cigarettes. Their concerted misinformation campaign worked. My earnest younger self was duped. Yes, that is me. Uh, I. Uh, <laughs> I saw my mom's agony with my own eyes, but wasn't even sure if nicotine was addictive. I was even less sure of the other detrimental health effects of cigarette smoking. Clear scientific results had been published, but I didn't find them. Fast forward to the 21st century. We live in a globally interconnected world. Knowledge is exploding, and we have access to so much on the web. As the 2008 Cyber Learning Report noted, the data and information deluge can be overwhelming. But if harnessed, it has great democratic and life-enhancing potential. Unlike my limited access to the Reader's Guide Index, today's youth have access to exponentially growing information through web search engines and indexes. Professional and governmental organizations are important parts of the landscape of science information. 21st century literacy requires knowing how to navigate this landscape, which is covered with both treasures and trash. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Experts have learned to tell the difference, though. This wordle shows the sources that 18 science researchers and science journalists said they'd turn to for information about diabetes, high blood pressure, the Gulf oil spill, and a volcano eruption. Notice the prevalence of organizations that convene experts to provide public information on the scientific consensus. Then we asked 90 students the same questions before they started our project. These are the kind of responses they had. Most of what they named were broad genres of information sources. So what to do about this? One promising and growing trend is citizen science, like these bird watchers recording their sightings. Such approaches encourage public participation in scientific research. In the best cases, they increase interest in the natural world and knowledge of how science is done. I'm part of a group of educators and researchers who have been exploring a slightly different tack. I call it citizen science journalism. We've design, designed a distributed learning environment that models what we hope today's youth can be a part of in the future. In it, they make use of emerging science and technology R&D by reporting for an authentic science news magazine we call Sidejourner. This Sidejourn network began in 2009. Youth work side by side with educators and journalists in schools and out of school programs. They produce, they produce science news in order to become better critical consumers of science news. As you can see, quite a few teachers at diverse schools have participated in professional development for our program. They've worked with thousands of students who've published hundreds of science news stories. Other teachers have picked up the approach through an NSTA book 
and conference workshops. I'm going to tell you two more stories to illustrate how our system works. A young man we call Sam researched how quitting smoking affects your body. After multiple drafts with feedback and revisions, he published it inside Journal. He's white, attended 10th grade at a suburban school, and did the work in a biology class. Amy researched tobacco use and cancer. She developed an infographic on the topic, which she refined, and then it was published. She is Latina, was in the 11th grade at the time, and participated in an out-of-school data journalism internship. To Sam and Amy, their research and publications were personally meaningful. Like me, they had family members with the experience, and that spurred their interest. Sam's grandfather had quit smoking, but Amy's grandfather had not. Both of them portrayed in their newspaper pieces why others should care about this and put the story in a broader context. Amy, for instance, summarized how the risk of several kinds of cancer increased with tobacco use. They developed science literacy to connect their personal concerns to these societal issues. Both youth searched for credible information and data from multiple sources on the web. The editor guided them to utilize information from the American Cancer Society and the Centers for Disease Control. During the first few years of our project, we focused on youth writing traditional science news stories. In our current cyber learning project, students and interns create infographics. Amy invented this representation to show the proportion of cancer, cancer patients diagnosed and killed by age. It was deeply personal because her grandfather was still smoking in his 60s. At the end, she understood how cancer onset and mortality affected people in different decades of their lives, as you can see along the bottom. And she could show her grandfather why he should quit. Among participants in our projects, we've seen improvements in the practices of searching for information, using multiple credible sources, making sense of the information they find, putting the information in context for society, and representing the data and information. We've learned some keys to success through several years of iterations in our design-based research. Learning is a matter of being and becoming new kinds of people. Youth are changed by working with people whose perspectives challenge and support them. The managing editor provides more hard-nosed feedback than teachers usually do, and the teacher medi mediates that input for the students. Through this interaction, the youth become the kinds of people who engage with science to answer questions that matter to them. This approach contrasts with general science media literacy approaches that teach brittle heuristics for evaluating website credibility. Embedding the search and evaluation in science in, of science information in a citizen science journalism community of practice makes the function of evaluating websites authentic. Publication in SciJourner provides an audience for the ideas and data youth portray in their stories and infographics. People nearby, like school administrators and school boards, get excited about the publications. But the web also allows authors to reach niche communities. By definition, very few people have the rare orphan disease this student's aunt was diagnosed with. But on the web, over 9,700 people found the article when searching for information on the disease. And she got feedback from several of them. Youth become objects, uh, youth publications they create become objects that help cross boundaries and expand horizons. That's a summary of where we are now. We have a small but growing network of youth doing citizen science journalism, both in school and out. I hope to grow our network and learn more about supporting youth in becoming more science literate. We're also interested in understanding what happens when youth talk about their new ideas with their families and, for instance, church members. How can they become effective brokers of these new ways of thinking they've developed? How do they cope with political and ideological conflicts that they encounter? We've helped learners see the strengths of certain kinds of 
of sources. But government agencies and panels need to be questioned too. How do we help youth develop reasonable skepticism about the USDA's proclamations on big agriculture and nutrition, for instance? Understanding the scope and severity of scientific phenomena requires data literacy as well. We know that visualizing data can enhance mathematical reasoning but we have much to learn about how best to use the tools and forms in the emerging genre of infographics. Finally, I raise two challenges that we as a cyber learning R&D community face. Much of the data available on the web is simply unusable today. It's not enough for data and metadata to be made public. We need to help data providers get better at designing portals and user experiences that the general public can understand, learn from, and use to further engage both with each other and with the science. I'm heartened by that the new cyber learning call for proposals explicitly discusses designing socio-technical systems. We've spent a great deal of time and effort over the years designing network tools and technical infrastructure, but often with too little attention to the social uses of those tools. Whether we're developing new technologies uh, or developing innovative uses of existing technologies, we all need to remember it's the social uptake and use of those tools that results in learning. So don't shy away from being agents of change. Finally, I want to thank my collaborators, including the participating educators and teams and the support of the National Science Foundation. Thank you.